Hi, my name is Krish. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. Um, I really appreciate it. And I hope that you uh, leave this with a better understanding of what exactly myocarditis is um, and the risks associated with it and how you can be best prepared to kind of understand what's going on and fight it from someone who, who has had it. Um, and so I guess it's been at the heart of a lot of controversy re recently. Um, I got the first, I first got myocarditis. It's essentially, it's, it's inflammation of the heart. Um, and it's, it's normal. It's, it's not like it's just been caused by COVID. Um, a lot of different viruses cause it, but it's seemed to be a very common problem with COVID, a very common result. And I guess I'll start from the beginning and around late January, the last week of January, um, I woke up, I got the booster on a uh, Tuesday and normally the incubation period, normally two to four days after you start feeling the effects. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, textbook two days later, I found some really serious chest pain. And the first day I just took some ibuprofen, um, which is a an natural anti-inflammatory. So it turns out the ibuprofen is actually the regimen uh, they prescribed me because it's a natural anti-inflammatory and it helps the pain. So it's like the perfect kind of, um, I guess, treatment for, for myocarditis. So it turns out I was taking the right thing by coincidence. Um, and so that first down on Saturday, when I first felt that pain, it, it toned down. So I was like, it, we're, I was thinking I was perfectly well. And even though I was a little scared, I never really had chest pain or heart problems before. I thought it was kind of like a one-off thing. So I wasn't super worried about it. I didn't really take action. Then on Sunday, it, I woke up and it was even worse. I had really bad chest pain. I had trouble breathing. I was really unable to swallow focus and that's when we kind of scheduled a, an emergency visit to the pediatrician. And then they don't have a lab. They don't have any blood work, but the, my pediatrician checked my heartbeat. It was all normal. Um, and she did really all she could. And all my movement and function seemed normal. But she noticed that she she did. I responded to ibuprofen, which is a huge indicator that it was myocarditis. And always with chest pain and any heart problems, potential heart problems, you always want to get that checked out. So she said, let's just take you to Seattle Children's to the ER. Let's just get you admitted. Let's see what's going on. And just in case, get some blood work done. That never hurts. And so we rushed over to Seattle Children's. And I very luckily, I'm really grateful to Seattle Children's. It's a really, really great hospital. They treated me extremely well. And I think that's like the one comfort throughout the whole situation was I was in such great care. Um, but I got, was very lucky to get a room. Um, we know how overwhelmed these hospitals are. I was super lucky to get a room. And... I was, when I got there, they immediately put an IV in, they got my lab work, um, they got my lab work tested and the lab work came back almost one or two hours later. Um, and I guess the main protein enzyme for heart level health is called troponin. And it's in the heart, it shouldn't leak out to the bloodstream unless your heart is injured. Um, and so normally it should be less than 0.05, mine was around six, which is 120 times the normal level. Now, I think that was the scariest part throughout the whole thing because we suspect it was myocarditis, but Honestly, it could have been anything at that point. It could have been something much more serious, something much more, I guess, it could be nothing. We don't really know at that point, but the troponin levels were not a good sign. And there were just general care doctors there. So until they admitted me to cardiology, they didn't know, they couldn't prescribe anything um, else. And the problem was cardiology rooms were booked. Um, they were full and it took, and I was, they were getting ready to treat me right there in the ER. And I was really lucky almost eight hours later that later night, I got a room in cardiology. That's when they kind of scheme. We're pretty sure it's myocarditis and we're going to put you on really strong ibuprofen. It was 800 milligrams three times a day. Just for reference, one of the tablets you take is 200. And they say you should only take two of those a day max. So I was, I was almost 12 times, like six times uh, what, what a normal person should be taking just for regular pain. And it's anti-inflammatory, so it helped the heart and it helped with the pain. And so I was admitted to the ER, I mean, to the to, to cardiology regular room with a nurse and they were doing... It was blood work around the clock every eight hours. It was vitals every four hours. It was, they were checking my urine. It was, it was the whole, I guess, shebang. And around, I think the second day, the, the main thing is with the EKG and ECG. EKG really tells you about the regularity of the heartbeat um, and measures kind of the size. They do a, a you kind of like when you go to um, an ultrasound, like they do an ultrasound to check what sex and gender of a pregnant lady is, of a, of a baby of a pregnant lady. It's a very similar thing that they did in my heart. And they saw the size of the ventricles and the different chambers of the heart, and they were beating fine, they looked fine, and they couldn't really tell the problem with it because all the tests were fine. They just knew troponin was off. So they knew it's probably myocarditis, but they couldn't really tell for sure. So that's when the, they said the only way to tell for sure is a cardiac MRI. And so on that second day, I was waiting for a cardiac MRI, and we finally got that, and that's when I was diagnosed with mild to moderate um, 
COVID booster-induced myocarditis. And so I guess that those couple of days, I was worried about recovery, the pain. And as I was really lucky, I think a couple of days through, I was like, the pain's going away. It was, I was feeling a lot better. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was I think, a, overall, a four-day stint in the hospital. Really painful. It was really scary. My first time in the hospital been, uh, since I can remember. But overall, I was really happy to get out of it. But I think the toughest part for me, and I think the part that I think is the where a lot of the misconception happens is, um, I guess one of the few follow things. So one, one, something really important is a lot of people like Joe Rogan, um, there's Joe Rogan came in the news recently, um, because he, he was advertising to kids in my age group, 15 to 17, that they shouldn't be taking the COVID vaccine because of the risk of this condition and they should, they'll be fine without it. Um, and even though I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, I think the main thing that you guys should know to make your own informed decision is that this myocarditis, um, it's actually caused by the COVID disease itself in, in higher frequency than the actual vaccine or the booster. So by leaving yourself susceptible to COVID, you're at a higher risk of myocarditis. And this only happens in six out of a million people, um, six out of a million teens my age. So it's it's a very, very rare disease. And even though it is life-threatening, it's it's really rare. And that shouldn't be, in my opinion, a real concern. But I think really the knowledge has to be out there. It has to be a risk that more people are aware of. Um, and as you get the boost, so what they actually told us is the first time you get the vaccine, the risk is the highest, second time is lower. And every time you get a subsequent booster, the, the chance of myocarditis becomes lower and lower and more subsequent diseases. So the, and obviously, um, the research on this is obviously developing as it goes. COVID is really, really new. And they said they, they know a little bit, but they're, they just know what they know about myocarditis. They don't really know much and they're still trying to learn more. And I, I think that's the biggest revolving piece in all of this is that, um, yeah, it's like a lot of doctors, COVID's a new thing. And I think we just need to be patient, even though it's especially scary for me as someone who's going through it. I think I just have trust that I was in, again, very good care and that whatever can be taken care of is being taken care of. And so I guess after that, I guess the, I think the, the, the most devastating part for me was one, it could be permanent. So after the, the MRI got in the hospital, they used that as kind of like a baseline set of MRI. Three months later, I'm going to get another MRI and six months later. And until that three to six month period, at least minimum six months, I'm not allowed to exercise at all, period. So I'm limited to just walking pretty much. I can't, um, I used to play basketball, I used to lift, uh, I used to be really active. I mean, any, you imagine a 17 year old, what, what uh, he or she does, I was limited to all that. So I was relegated to my house and not able to do much. I think that was one of the most devastating parts for me personally was being able to cope and deal with that. Um, and I think the other thing was just every two weeks I'd have follow-up appointments, EKGs, ECAGs, and there's an outpatient clinic in Bellevue where I was sent to. Um, and my my new cardiologist, she was super accommodating, super nice. Um, and really realizing that, yeah, this was a tough transition for someone who was super active like me, um, who needed to kind of change this sedentary lifestyle. Um, and so she was, uh, really leaning about hooking me up to an exercise lab and seeing if I could really get back to being full function earlier. But with any condition like this, it's really, really important to stay safe. Um, if you were to exercise kind of the, the issue is the infl inflamed part of your heart, the electrical signals that run through that, um, it could develop new electrical pathways that run through that inflamed region. And then when that inflamed region eventually dies down, those electrical pathways will still run through and can cause irregularities in the heartbeat, which is arrhythmia, which is even more dangerous. It could be permanent, it could cause heart murmurs, all these things that honestly are way scarier than the condition, which is, um, I guess, hard to hard to fathom. So yeah, so these past, I guess I'm almost, I'm almost at my three month MRI, um, which is in two or three weeks. And so I've been keeping a really, really, sedentarian and it's been tough um i talked to my doc uh, my cardiologist and said um, if this is permanent if there is permanent scar residue on my heart and this extra thing is permanent how how would i deal with that um and she said yeah like new research in my that's kind of a shifting opinion many cardiologists disagree some would say yeah you just i mean it just that's just how it has to be if you want to stay safe and others would say yeah sedentary lifestyle is probably even more harmful than risking this potential arrhythmia so maybe and we've seen in the long run in 60, 70 years, high blood pressure, all these things that are caused by lack of exercise. And maybe we say, yeah, just be careful. We monitor it. But yeah, you can exercise and you can do what you want um, and while being monitored. So 
that's really been a tough decision for me and a really stressful thing for me is just determining in three to six months where, where I'm going to stand with my life um, and really exercise because that, that's a huge part of, it's going to be a huge part of everything um, going forward. And so I guess the main thing, main couple of things I want to I leave you guys with after kind of this long story is, um, one, I just hope you leave with some knowledge of what, what the condition is. I know, especially for this age group, Often we might not do the read, might think like, oh, we take a vaccine, we take a booster. We've taken so many in the past. We've gotten a lot of immunizations. We don't really think of the risks, um, especially we think like so little people have it, like it's not really a problem for me, which is definitely true to some extent. But I think it's important to know the symptoms and know that if some pain is happening, something like this is happening, it's something serious, something you should definitely get checked out and just, just be wary of what's going on. Um, and yeah, I just hope that you left with some more knowledge of what you had and I hope that you guys can stay educated and hopefully make a decision and spread that. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. And obviously if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to respond. Uh, feel free to re uh, reach out to me on my cell phone or my email. My email is um, krish.jane, uh, K-R-I-S-H dot J-A-I-N at outlook.com. Feel free to reach out and ask any questions. I would be more than happy to help and assist. Thank you so much.